Now it's time to take on Bob Dylan's title track from his second album of original songs, The Times There Are Changing. And the song was, of course, a game changer, and it's one of his signature tunes. Uh, yes, probably one that he distanced from, not completely, that's exaggerated, but distanced from over time as he rejected the troubadour, you know, mantle and voice of a generation uh, in order to save his sanity. But all of that was yet to come. Uh, here, at this time, he was the man, the very young man, who wrote Blowing in the Wind, Masters of War, A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall, songs like that. And at this point, he really doubled down. So it's pretty ironic. Even if he would regret being the nation's troubadour, he couldn't, at this stage of his career, have done a better job of applying for the position. And this song was a huge part of that. Come gather around people wherever you roam. I mean, that's as troubadour-esque as it gets for a song opening, right? Like somebody is strumming his guitar and, you know, people standing nearby going about their daily lives gathering around to hear a story. And it'd be a story about the world, right? Some battle or what have you, but you'd have a musician, you know, spreading the news, talking about what people are going through. And here Dylan is talking about what society in general, especially in America, was going through. And it can be easily argued, of course, that Dylan is the greatest songwriter ever at capturing the feeling in the air. Anyway, let's get on to song mechanics here. The song has five stanzas of nine lines each, so it's very symmetrical, like vertically, north-south. If you will. On top of that, take a look here. This is the opening one, of course. Look at the bold and the underlined. Every time, except for the last stanza where Dylan does his typical thing and gives you a kind of subtle auditory clue that the song is ending, every other time, lines 2, 4, 6, and 8 rhyme, and they don't just rhyme. They rhyme as much as possible, and, you know, if you've seen some of the other videos in this series, what I mean is groan, stone, bone. They're really similar words in terms of length, syllables. And that helps establish this rhythmic regularity that the song is built around in large part. So you'll have that 2, 4, 6, 8, and then you'll always have lines 7 and 9 rhyming with each other. That's the underline. And throughout the entire song, those two lines not only always rhyme, but they all, in all instances, use the exact same sound. The final line, line 9, is always for the times they are changing. But the last word in line 7 that it rhymes with is always a different word. And anyway, you might have noticed then, this song does not have a normal refrain at all. Now let's move on to the imagery, if you will. Notice how the water theme, the drowning theme, is consistent. Admit that the waters around you have grown, drenched to the bone, sink like a stone. So there's that metaphorical rhyming that I've talked about so much in other videos, right? It's rhyming in terms of more than just sound. A rhyme means a return, a return of a sound, but he brings the return of a thought as well. And each stanza does that with a distinct message. In the case of the opening stanza, then we know that that relates to drowning, flooding. Uh, we know that he loves the biblical flood myth, but it has greater implications than that, as I'm sure Dylan was acutely aware when he wrote this, right? So it's this innate fear, and it's a calamity when there's a flood, like all of civilization, all of that town is imperiled. And there's something deeply unsettling about rising waters when they're rising in a threatening way. Uh, this image, by the way, relates to the actual biblical flood, and then the next one to the myth of Atlantis. Again, then, it's a deeply ingrained cultural metaphor, a global one, for kind of impending doom, or, you know, rising chaos, and an impending crisis, which was the feeling in the air that he was tapping into. So effectively, as a songwriter, and speaking of that, the second stanza begins, Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen, and keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. Well, there's sweet irony in that, since he, with his typewriter, was in that exact position. He was himself one of those writers and critics who had a chance to say something meaningful and impactful about the times. And, of course, he did it as well as anyone ever has in music. The stanza continues. And don't speak too soon, for the wheel's still in spin, and there's no telling who that it's naming. For the loser now will be later to win, for the times they are changing. So we have a new metaphor, and an equally ancient one as the flood, and that's the wheel. And that was a really common device in medieval art, uh, survives today in tarot cards, by the way, on card 10, the wheel. But, regardless, it was a symbol of changing fortunes. Uh, really specifically what Dylan was talking about, that whoever's up high now is going to end up low, and vice versa. Next stanza starts, Come senators, congressmen, please heed the call. So every stanza starts by calling somebody out, getting their attention, right? This time, it's the politicians. 
This picture, by the way, is of uh, the U.S. Senate in 1963, the exact year this song came out. Dylan had just talked about writers prophesying in the last stanza, and here he gets the most prophetic part of the song. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall, for he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. There's a battle outside and it's a raging. It'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. The infamous social unrest and tumult of the 60s wasn't even close to setting in at the time of this song. It would of course come with the full escalation of the war in Vietnam uh, and the civil rights movement. Speaking of that, this picture here features a young John Lewis getting beaten in the foreground. And this is the absolute heart of the song. Whenever times are changing, when the ground is kind of shifting beneath everybody's feet, when there's a reckoning coming, and most especially when a power structure is going to get toppled, this song is appropriate, and that's why it just keeps coming back over and over again. Here's a picture, of course, of the March on Washington, which Dylan was present for. And here's an image from Selma, both of these featuring Dr. King, of course, in the foreground. And here's a much more recent protest, and look how similar the image is, right? And this is during the Trump administration about the family separations at the border. That last one being a series of protests that me and my family participated in. And here's the most iconic image from the Tiananmen Square riots about many years ago. So remember, this is not actually a protest song. It's not protesting anything the way that Blown in the Wind, you know, softly, indirectly was. I mean, people from both sides of the political spectrum protest things every year. It's more about this, what we're saying here. This is the fall of the Berlin Wall. You know, the recognition that you're in an extraordinary time when things are fundamentally changing. But there is a subtle call to arms as well. We'll soon shake your windows and rattle your walls. And you can hear Dylan's voice rise, kind of rise to the occasion at that part of the song. So you're kind of, you know, implored to join in. Well, I should get to at least one kind of linguistic trick here, right? So how about, there's a battle outside and it's raging. It'll soon check your windows and rattle your walls. Battle and rattle rhyme, but battle's in the first half of one line, and then in the next line, rattle is in the second half. Well, what do you even call that? It's not rhyming in the sense of the ends of lines. It's not alliteration either, but it works, right? It's, again, like, audibly tying together as many parts of the songs, as many lines, as many words as possible. So the song has addressed his audience, writers, politicians, and now in the penultimate stanza, parents. Come mothers and fathers throughout the land, and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. That's a startling set of couplets there. They, of course, bring up the specter of the famous generation gap of the time. And I think you'd be fairly hard-pressed to find any writer, not just a songwriter, who more succinctly and effectively captured the spirit of the moment in regard to that. And this is where the timeless quality that a lot of Dylan's songs have comes into play. Uh, a person at the right age of any generation is going to feel just fully energized when they hear those lines. In comparison, think of the, uh, the Who's famous, Hope I Die Before I Get Old. You know, great line, also startling, but sounds very much like a product of its time. Not just musically, which it absolutely does, but even just the, the syntax, you know, the words. like That doesn't sound like a, a line that could have come from a poem at any time in history. Meanwhile, with Dylan, it really seems like it could have been the 19th century instead of the 20th. And I think what we said about the Who can be applied to so much rebellious teenage rock music. Uh, great as it is, right? Like, for instance, here, with early punk music. Well, moving on, Dylan saved the best for last. Uh, the final stanza... The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast, the slow and now will later be fast. As the present now will later be past, the order is rapidly fading, and the first one now will later be last, for the times they are changing. The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast. That's ancient sounding language. A line being drawn, you know, that refers to a line being drawn in the sand, so that has incredibly deep roots. The curse it is cast. Sounds like something from a fairy tale. Meanwhile, the line about the first one now, later being last, is an obvious biblical illusion, one that fits the theme of the whole song. And, you should notice, right off the bat, this is telling you that the song is about to end. It's the first opening line, first opening couplet, that doesn't address anybody. The other thing is that the first six lines are very uniform in a way that you don't see in the other parts. Uh, they're all either exactly four or five words, so they form this very, you know, uniform column. You can see that on the page, but more importantly, you know, it's a song. 
uh, your ear should pick up on that as well and notice that something's different. Uh, and, you know, with typical rock pop song structures, it's incredibly obvious when the song's about to end, right? It's kind of announced. Uh, Dylan often doesn't do that. Overall, the song does so many interesting things. Uh, I try to keep these videos relatively short. I don't think anyone wants a 30-minute dissertation on just one song. But uh, there really is, and that's the defining characteristic uh, of his music and his songwriting especially, is you can just keep finding new things to notice if you look hard enough. Something else he does in terms of breaking the rules for the final stanza is that he reuses the same word. Lines 3 and 5 end with now. The slow and now will later be fast as the present now will later be past. Definitely a great pair of couplets, but notice that doesn't happen anywhere else in the song. Let's end with a couple of miscellaneous notes. Uh, we can't bypass the oft-repeated story that a friend of Dylan's walked into his apartment, looked at the typewriter, saw a lyric uh, for this song, and said, What is this shit, man? And Dylan just nonchalantly replied, Well, it seems to be what the people want. Love that vignette, and it just brings up uh, you know, Dylan's very ambivalent relationship to the music that he was the absolute master of. Later, of course, he, for the most part, turned his back entirely on it, uh, and 60 years later, essentially, still no one has been able to match him. Despite that, Dylan said this song was modeled after Irish and Scottish ballads, like Come All Ye Bold Highwaymen. Uh, this illustration here is from an old out-of-print book related to Tales of Highwaymen, by the way. Also, by the way, it was in tales like that, and just literature from that time, you know, centuries back, that you would have this A prefix device that Dylan uses, of course, with a change in. And that's part of that ancient-sounding language that we talked about earlier in the video. Anyway, the times they are changing. An epic song in the Dylan catalog, and one of those rare musical works that becomes the soundtrack to a critical time in history. You know, there's a lot of great songs by great songwriters and artists who typify a period, a, you know, disco, 80s, whatever. But it's something else entirely to put out a song that becomes the soundtrack to a time when everything was changing. No pun intended. A point where, you know, politics and art and basically all of life was really turning a page. In closing, Dylan said about this song, I wanted to write a big song, with short, concise verses that piled up on each other in a hypnotic way. Well, mission accomplished. Thanks.